So in this video, what I'd like to do is introduce the language of predicate logic. And I want to do this by explaining why we would move from a logical language like propositional logic to another logical language at all. So it's helpful to think about what's good about the language of propositional logic. What are its strengths and what are its weaknesses? And once we identify these strengths and weaknesses, it will allow us to find a motivation for moving to a different logical language like the language of predicate logic, which I'll talk more about in future videos. So the first strength of propositional logic is that if you have an argument that's valid in the language of propositional logic, I'm using the, val the term valid here sort of loosely in terms of either a case of semantic entailment or a case of uh, where you can provide a derivation or a syntactic entailment. But let's say you identify an argument in the formal language of propositional logic as valid or a good argument. You can translate that argument from propositional logic into English and the result, the resulting translation will be a valid English argument. And so this gives us a nice way of identifying valid arguments in English because if you can find one in the language of propositional logic, then you can find one in English. The second nice feature of propositional logic is that there are decision procedures associated with it. That is, if you're given an argument, you can use a truth table or a truth tree to kind of mechanically test to see if it's an instance of logical consequence. Is it, it's an instance of, that is, it's a valid or invalid argument. You can do other things with tables, of course, you can check to see if a set of formulas are consistent or check to see if a proposition is a tautology or something like that. And But the thing that's nice about it is, in contrast to English, where we might make use of a tool of imagining the premises being true and the conclusion false, in propositional logic, since it's uh, formulated as a formal language, we also have this kind of algorithmic or mechanical or automatic way of checking to see if the argument is valid or invalid. So that's a nice perk. The third thing is that there's a proof system. Uh, we have these set of codified rules for reasoning from certain formulas to another formula. So the fact that we have this codified set of rules is a nice feature. It allows kind of um, a kind of consensus or uniformity about like whether or not something is a proof of an, a formula or not. So what's the problem with propositional logic? The main problem with propositional logic is its expressiveness. That is, it is not expressive enough. And so what does this mean? What it means is that there are some valid arguments in English, some arguments in English where we say the conclusion is a logical consequence of the premises. But when we go to translate that argument into the language of propositional logic, what we see is it doesn't come out as an instance of logical consequence. That is, we have a valid argument in English. When we look in the language of propositional logic, what do we see? Well, it doesn't come out as a valid argument in the language of propositional logic. So that seems like a kind of problem with the formal language. What we would like is that the formal language is capable of capturing every valid argument in English, if not more. So let me give you an analogical example of why this might be important. Let's take a language and we're just going to kind of make up a language and but we'll call it language L1. Now let's say this language has, you know, a host of different terms, but when we talk about emotions in this language, it has a term for, let's say, complete and utter happiness. And there's also a term for complete and utter sadness. Now this language, you know, if you're very, feeling very happy, you're able to convey this feeling of happiness to someone else. You just use the term that corresponds to expressing a state of complete and utter happiness. And if you're just in tears crying deeply, you're so sad, then you're capable of conveying that idea to other people. But take a scenario where, say, um, I mean, you can think of a number of different scenarios, but let's just use an example of, um, let's say you have a child and your child is going off to college or doing something like that. Your little son or daughter or whatever is going off to college and you like your child. And so you might have a sort of mix of emotions. On the one hand, you are kind of happy. This is a good thing for your child. 
You think that they aren't going to be driven into severe debt. You think this is going to help develop them as a person. But on the other hand, you are also a little bit sad about it. You're going to miss your child. Uh, this is a person you've raised and spent time with for many years. So you have what we might say is a kind of mix of emotions, or a sort of blend. Or you might say, on the one hand, you feel happy about this whole thing, and on the other hand, you feel a little bit sad about it. Now, if we look at the language L1, one of the things that we see is that it looks difficult to express this. That is, we want to might convey to someone that we have this feeling, this mix of happiness and sadness where we don't feel completely happy about it and we don't feel completely sad about it, but instead we feel a kind of hybrid of those emotions. Or if you don't think like that's what's a, an accurate characterization of the situation, you at least want some type of term to say that I have this kind of combination of these two feelings uh, or I feel happiness in this respect or that respect. And so we need a way of kind of linking those two. So this is an artificial example just to kind of illustrate that one of the problems that we identify with language one is that it doesn't seem to be expressive enough. It only allows us to express things in terms of complete happiness and sadness. But what we would like is a language with a little bit more power. We want a language that gives us the capacity, these are uh, muscles here in case you didn't know, uh, to indicate the expressiveness. We want a language that gives us the capacity to kind of combine different ideas together, or let's say kind of fuse them together. And so we would like a language, let's say L2, um, that is capable of doing this. And if we don't have such a language, we feel that this language is lacking in some respects. It doesn't fulfill the function or the kind of goals that we want it to. So how does this apply to the language of propositional logic? Let's take an argument that looks intuitively valid. That is, we want to say that this is an instance of logical consequence and show how Propositional logic sort of struggles to capture this aspect of it. So here we have an argument, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, and Socrates is mortal. Now when we look at this, we might say, oh, this is a case of logical consequence. We have a, if we can imagine the premises being true, and if these premises are true, if all men are mortal, so we have, let's say, this kind of circle, and all the men we put in here, and it's in this sort of larger class of all the mortal things, you know, living beings that aren't like humans or whatever. And we say that uh, Socrates, we have this kind of Socrates person right here, he is a man. And if he's in this kind of class of individuals who are men, then he's in the larger class of individuals that are mortal. So we say that it's impossible for the premises to be true, and the conclusion to be false, this scenario can't hold. And so we think this is a kind of valid argument to use a sort of loose term. And we would like a formal language to be able to capture this. But what we see when we try to translate this argument into the language of propositional logic is there isn't a clean way of doing it. If we look at sentences and whenever we identify if then, we use the conditional sign or not to use negation. What we, what we see when we look at this particular argument is it looks like a series of simple sentences. You know, this kind of predicate and, or subject and predicate. And so we might translate this using simple sentences, using propositional logic or propositional letters. So if we, for premise one right here, we might translate it as M. So all men are mortal. We just let that be translated into the language of propositional logic as M. Premise two, we can translate as S. And the conclusion, we can simply translate as R. So what this gives us is, in the language of propositional logic, is M, S, therefore, R. But the issue is that there isn't a way to prove that R follows from M and S, and R is not semantically entailed by M and S. So that if we used a true table and true tree, we would see that it doesn't show or doesn't determine R to be a logical consequence or is following from M and S. In other words, to kind of sum this all up, it gives us the wrong result. We want 
this particular argument to be identified as valid in the formal language, um, but it doesn't, that doesn't occur. And so we think that there is a problem. There's a sort of problem with propositional logic. It doesn't express this particular argument as valid. So to summarize here, what we're saying is that the language of propositional logic is not expressive enough. What we want is a language that's capable of expressing all of the arguments that um, propositional logic identifies as valid, but also a host of others that it doesn't capture as valid when those arguments are valid. So what this does is motivate a move to a more expressive or more powerful logical language. And that's the language of predicate logic, which I will kind of talk about in future videos. This language is supposed to, or does, capture all of the arguments that are valid in propositional logic, as well as a host of other ones, including that Socrates is mortal example. It will take that argument, translate it into the formal language, and when we run a particular test on it, it'll come out as valid, which is the result that we would like.